Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Richard Heidemann, and it was my privilege to serve uh, five years as chair of the museum's Washington Lawyers Committee, which is one of the sponsors of tonight's outstanding program. It is my honor to welcome you on behalf of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum to tonight's program, A Personal Quest for Justice, The Origins of Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity. As tonight's program is being webcast, we also want to give a warm welcome to our global audience watching tonight's program online. Indeed, we gather tonight more than 80 years after the enactment of the Nuremberg Laws, which essentially enabled state-sponsored bias and hate, disenfranchising those of the Jewish faith and other religions and other groups, sitting in Europe and setting the stage for the Holocaust and the attempt to annihilate the Jewish people and other people. International law, at the time was very, shall we say, um, unknown, unrespected, and certainly neither protected human rights nor acted to prevent the genocide of people on religious or other grounds. The end of World War II and the Holocaust is forever remembered as a major turning point in legal history with the establishment of the Nuremberg Charter and international military tribunals at Nuremberg, the realm of human rights law gained momentum as Nazi perpetrators were brought to justice, while the international military tribunals at Nuremberg 70 years ago were the first to try cases of crimes against humanity, they would uh, certainly not be the last. From then on, the establishment of new charges, terminology, UN conventions, international genocide tribunals have in fact developed into the realm of international criminal law as we know it today and international human rights law as we have come to honor it and to cherish it. Our very special guest speaker this evening has both a personal and professional connection to this important subject. Philippe Sands, author of the new book, East West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, is an international lawyer and professor of law at University College London. He is also the grandson of Holocaust survivors. Tonight, he will discuss his exploration of the work of Hirsch Lauterpach and Raphael Lemkin, two fathers of international and humanitarian law, without whose work the concept, the meaningful concept of genocide would not be before us today. It was their lives and legacy and how the legacy of these two men have been intertwined with their own professional and personal identities that are subjects of our speaker's presentation tonight. He will be joined this evening also by Nicholas Frank, son of Nazi Governor General Hans Frank, to explore with us how law and legacy interplay in our memory and reconciliation with atrocities, both past and present. We're thrilled to have as our moderator tonight Charles Lane of the Washington Post, we thank each of them for being here. For those of you in the audience who desire to obtain and are eligible to receive continuing legal education credit for tonight's pr program, please be sure that you have signed in to the uh, monitored attendance forms that are out in the lobby as that is a requirement. A CLE certificate of attendance will be sent to you following the program. In addition, we encourage that you please remain tonight to ask questions of our panel even after the discussion. Following the program, our author's book will be available for purchase and he will be in the lobby to sign copies of the book. We thank you for joining us for this insightful discussion. 
Uh, before I ask you to welcome uh, both uh, Philippe Sands and uh, Charles Lane, I want to um, encourage that you join the conversation for those of you who are watching and also those in the audience on both uh, Twitter and Facebook. Please use the hashtag Quest for Justice. In addition, we will take your questions through social media later in the program. On behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Washington Lawyers Committee of the Museum, we welcome you and we welcome our special guests and invite both uh, Charles Lane and uh, Philippe Sands to the um, podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. I pronounced your name you properly. Did, you did okay. Well, thank you very, very much, everyone. Uh, just uh, for identification purposes, I'm Charles Lane. Um, this is Philippe Sands. And uh, I think I speak for both of us when I say we're very honored to uh, have been asked to come before you tonight and talk about this uh, really remarkable uh, piece of And um, I just thought I would get the discussion started by asking you, uh, with respect to your book, um, uh, this seems to have been one of those cases where, as is so often the case with our best stories, they're serendipitous, we kind of stumble into them. Tell us a little bit about how you came to this topic. And I, I take it, it, was, uh, it all began with an invitation to give a lecture. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, I wear a number of different hats. I'm an academic. I teach. Uh, in Britain, I've taught at various American law schools, and I'm also a barrister, and some of the cases that I do involve issues of crimes against humanity and genocide, and I'd written a couple of books um, on the subject, and in the spring of 2010, I received by email an invitation to deliver a public lecture at the University of Lviv in the western Ukraine on my work on crimes against humanity and genocide. They sort of, I think, wanted to know about the cases that I've been involved in, Pinochet, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Croatia, these kinds of cases. I'm very fortunate in getting a number of invitations, most of which I don't do. This one I accepted for a very personal reason, which was that my grandfather was born in the city of Lviv, which used to be known as Lvov, and before that, Lemberg. Uh, and he was born there in 1904. Uh, he lived a long life. He lived until 1997. I knew him very well. But I knew nothing about what happened before 1945. It's a common story, I suspect, for a lot of people. Uh, he would not talk about what happened before. And so I accepted uh, the invitation uh, to find out about uh, his life. You can see um, on the screen an image of his family. He's the little guy in the middle um, with big ears. And uh, that is my grandfather, Leon Buchholz. And this was taken in Lemberg in about 1913. Uh, what I discovered was that he left a year later. The Russians um, occupied Lemberg. Uh, his brother, who is the, in the second row, uh, on the right-hand side in a military uniform, uh, was killed in September 1914 in a battle described by the New York Times, sorry, a competitor, um, as the greatest holocaust. I'm sure they got it wrong. The, well, well the, what they described the Battle of Lemberg as the greatest holocaust known in human history. Uh, they used that word, astonishingly. Uh, and uh, his uh, brother, Emil, was killed. And a few weeks later, his father died of a broken heart. And so he left with his mother and his two sisters and I chased the story from them. Well, in a way, this very special city, I'm gonna call it Lemberg because that's a little easier to pronounce, this very special city with so many different civilizations coming and going across it, it's almost like a character in your book in a way. Give us a little bit about what you, you learned about the city. We'll get a little bit more into your family story, but tell us why this city is so significant and why it's, uh, it's, it's got the special uh, place in this larger story of the Holocaust that it does. It's a remarkable place. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire for about 172 years uh, before it became part of Poland and then 
part of the Soviet Union and then part of Germany and then part of Ukraine. I mean, it kept changing hands eight times in the space of 30 years between 1914 and 1945. Very multicultural city. When my grandfather was born there, there were three main communities, roughly equal in number, Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians. And they lived in a relative harmony. There was discrimination, uh, in particular, it has to be said, against the Ukrainian uh, community. Um, the Poles were m more or less uh, in, in charge. And I think it was the multiculturalism of the place that was so striking for me. When I go back, I went back in, for the first time in, I went for the first time in October 2010, and I discovered a city that felt like a sort of little Vienna. It's absolutely exquisite. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, and the streets were more or less unchanged. It was undamaged pretty much from both wars. Uh, and it was a place that had an extraordinary department of mathematics, an extraordinary department of philosophy, an incredibly important law school, older than Harvard Law School. Uh, and it, uh, by the time I got there, uh, all that had gone. And tell us a little bit about your own family, a little more, I should say, and both what you discovered about them through your research that you hadn't known before and uh, what you learned a little bit about the wider Jewish community and how they fit into that. So what you need to understand is uh, it was a happenstance. So I go off to this extraordinary city. I'm asked to deliver a lecture on crimes against humanity and genocide. I go because my grandfather was born there. In the summer of 2010, I start doing some research on the lecture and I discover something extraordinary. The man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law, Hirsch Lauterpacht, in 1945, through Robert Jackson, the prosecutor at Nuremberg, went to the very law school that had invited me and had lived in Lemberg. And those who had invited me were unaware of this fact. Hmm. And then a few days later, I discovered that the man who invented the concept of genocide, Raphael Lemkin, had been to the same university, lived in the same city, and had invented the concept of genocide 25 years later. They didn't actually overlap. Uh, Lauterpacht was there from 1915 to 1919. Lemkin was there from 1921 to 1926. I immersed myself in the research and I discovered that the man who is, um, if you like, in the second row, I mean, I say the one with the beard, but they've all got beards. Um, so if you go to the man in the bottom, the first row, just above him, the sort of cut in one, that is Julius Makarevich. Julius Makarevich taught criminal law to both Lauterpacht and Lemkin. And he, I believe, and I set out in the book, is the man who inspired them to do what they did. So in, in preparing this lecture, these discoveries came much later, I'm sort of undergoing a detective story about the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide. So park that idea, I'm going off in that direction. But at the same time, I'm going off in another direction on a quest for what happened to my family. I knew nothing. Uh, in short, my grandfather moves from Lemberg to Vienna in 1914. He lives in Vienna until 1939. He is then expelled by the Nazis and he moves to Paris, uh, but he travels on his own and he leaves behind a child, my mother, who is six months old, and his wife, to whom he has been wed for only 18 months. And the second detective story in the book is to understand what happened to that family. Why were they separated? Why did my grandfather travel alone? Who took my mother from Vienna to Paris six months after my grandfather had left? And why did my grandmother stay in Vienna? Well, you're not going to spoil it for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> How long have you got? That's um, I, I mean, I would never expected to write a book about this, and it's why it's taken six and a half years uh, to write it. Um, it's a book that required um, it, it, 
me to hire a private detective in Vienna to do unbelievable amounts of research in archives uh, across, I think, it's four continents. What do I discover? Uh, I mean, I discovered so many coincidences. It, it, is, it, is, it is almost uh, extraordinary. So, so let me just throw a couple out to you. I learn that my great-grandmother, Amalia Flaschner, is born in a town called Zhulkiev, which is about 25 kilometers from Lemberg. And I learn that she is born on the same street as Hirsch Lauterpacht. Okay, so the connections are getting closer and closer. Now, you need to know something about the Lauterpacht name. I studied law at Cambridge University in England, and my first teacher of international law was Elie Lauterpacht, who was the son of Hirsch Lauterpacht. In 1984, Elie Lauterpacht gives me my first job as a young research fellow at the Lauterpack Center for International Law in Cambridge. It, it takes Ellie and I to know each other for 30 years before we discover that we can trace our origins to the very same street in Zhulkiev, Lemberger Strasse, which is east-west street of the title. Fast forward the research and you'll begin to understand why it takes six or seven years. The first street my great-grandmother would have walked down was Lemberger Strasse. She was born on that street. That was in 1870. Fast forward to 1942, and the last street she walked down, when she was deported from Vienna to Theresienstadt to Treblinka on the same transport as the three sisters of Sigmund Freud. The Germans kept extraordinarily detailed records, so that is established uh, absolutely clearly. And more to the point, it enabled me to learn that she would have been observed coming off that transport at the rail platform in Treblinka by a man called Samuel Reisman, who gave testimony at the Nuremberg trial as one of the very few survivors from Treblinka. She gets off the train, she walks down a street called Himmelfahrtstrasse, which is the street to heaven that leads from the platform to the gas chamber, and two weeks later, she is followed down that very same street by the parents of Raphael Lemkin. So in a very curious way, her life is bookended. It begins on the same street as the Lauterpacts. It finishes on the same street as the Lemkins. I've spent 25 years of my life doing cases about crimes against humanity and genocide invented by Lauterpacht and Lemkin, and I had no idea when I started this project that I had this indirect geographical connection with these two men. Well, let's talk about them because obviously their intellectual projects, which ultimately became their intellectual achievements, have kind of turned into your, or the, the outline or the, the framework of your subsequent work as a lawyer. For maybe, I know there are a lot of lawyers in the, in the audience, but maybe both for them and for those who aren't lawyers, why are these concepts of, they seem sort of vaguely familiar, I guess, to all of us, of genocide and crimes against humanity. Tell us why they were original in their time, number one, and what is different about each? What's the, the crucial distinction? So, let, let, let me give you the short version, uh, or, or we will be here for hours. As of 1939, the position in international law was very clear and simple. If a country wanted to eliminate a part of its own population on grounds of gender, race, nationality, ethnicity, whatever, there was no rule of international law which prevented it. You were entirely free to kill an entire population. That was the world in which Hirsch Lauterpacht on the left and Raphael Lemkin studied on the right, studied international law at Lviv University. Let me just give you one moment on each man's path so you get an understanding of how they got to where they got to. Uh, Lauterpacht leaves Lemberg in 1919. He goes to Vienna. He st studies with Hans Kelsen. He then goes to London with his new wife, studies at the London School of Economics, becomes appointed a lecturer at the London School of Economics, and then is appointed the Huell Professor of International Law at Cambridge University from 1937. His family remains behind in Lemberg. In 1941, he gets to know Robert Jackson. In 1942, he starts working with the British to prepare a prosecution, which became Nuremberg. In 1945, 
he is hired by the British to join the prosecution team. And on the 29th of, Jan of July, 1945, he meets in his garden. You can see the picture there. That's his garden in Cranmer Road in Cambridge. And he is visited by Robert Jackson. And it is he, Lauterpacht, who suggests that the concept of crimes against humanity be inserted into the Nuremberg Statute. That's Lauterpacht's path. Lemkin's path is rather different. He leaves Lemberg Law School, Lvov Law School, in 1926. He becomes a public prosecutor. In 1933, he tries to persuade the League of Nations to create new crimes on barbarism and vandalism. It fails. Hitler has just come into power. And he then becomes a private attorney in at Warsaw. He flees in 39. He ends up here in the United States as a visiting professor at Duke University in North Carolina. And he lugs with him to America a collection of thousands of Nazi decrees, which originate from all of the occupied territories. And he examines them and writes a book, which is published by the Carnegie Foundation in, the sum, in, the, in November of 1944, chapter nine of which is called Genocide. He has invented the term for the destruction of groups. The essential difference between the two is that Lauterpacht is concerned with the protection of individuals, crimes against humanity, as you can see on the screen. Lauterpacht is the originator of the modern system of human rights. He wrote the first book on it, published in 1945, The International Bill of Rights of Man. Genocide is concerned not with the protection of individuals, but with the protection of groups. And the essential difference between the two is as follows. Every genocide will also be a crime against humanity. The killing of a large number of people systematically will be a crime against humanity, inevitably. But not every killing of a large number of individuals will be a genocide. To prove a genocide, you have to prove an intent, um, it's about motive, and you have to establish the intention to kill those people as part of a plan to destroy the group of which they are members in whole or in part. It's, it's Lemkin's invention. One thing you need to know is that Lauterpacht was totally opposed to the concept of genocide. He feared that the reification of groups, the protection of groups, would trump the protection of individuals and that the tyranny of excess of power by states would be replaced by the tyranny of excess of power of groups. It would pit one group against another. Okay, says Lemkin, fair enough, but the reality is that people, individuals, are not killed because of their individual qualities, characteristics. They are killed because they are members of a group and the law must reflect that reality. And if you read the book, you'll find me oscillating between the two men. Frankly, if I had to have dinner with one of them, I'd have dinner with Lemkin. But intellectually, I feel more connected uh, with Lauterpacht, who is more of an idealist. Lemkin is the more pragmatic person. Uh, we can carry on as to what happened next, but I'll take my cue well, from you, But you got Charles. me going, because I'm curious, and, and this is a part of the book I haven't gotten to yet, if, if indeed it's in there. I mean, they were both from Lemberg, and they were obviously both in the same field, both Jewish men. How well did they know each other? Did their paths cross? Were they rivals in some sense? It, I would have thought that Lemkin would have been a little um, bothered by the fact that uh, Lauterpacht's doctrine had in effect dominated the Nuremberg process, had been the intellectual construct adopted there. Well, um, the two men went to the same law school. I have located them in the same town, Lviv in 1923, Cambridge, England in 1946, at the same moment. They never actually crossed at Nuremberg. They were both part of the prosecution team, Lemkin for the Americans, Lauterpacht for the British, but they were never in the Nuremberg courtroom at the same moment. And it seems they never actually met. Huh. They both knew of each other's work. They both cited to each other's work. They both disagreed with their respective uh, approaches, um, but they were engaged, if you like, in an intellectual battle. They had the same objectives, motivated by the desire to use the law to prevent 
mass atrocity, but they have different means of getting there. You see here the bench of the Nuremberg courtroom. They were both part of the prosecution team. Lauterpacht gets crimes against humanity into the Nuremberg statute, as you saw earlier. Lemkin fails to get genocide into the Nuremberg statute in August 1945, but he succeeds in getting the concept of genocide into the indictment uh, of the uh, 22 who are in the courtroom charged with war crimes, crimes against humanity, the crime of aggression. And the battle then begins. On the first day of the trial, they uh, are, Lauterpacht is present, Lemkin is not. Both crimes against humanity and genocide are uh, evoked. Um, what then happens in the course of the trial is crimes against humanity takes root, but whilst the Soviets and the French have evoked genocide, protection of groups, the British do not in their opening arguments, and the Americans do not either. And in fact, the word genocide never passes Robert Jackson's lips in the courtroom. By the close of the trial, genocide has attracted the support of the British, and Hartley Shawcross, the British prosecutor, uses it in his closing argument, although Lauterpacht wrote the legal parts of that closing argument, did not include the word genocide, and Shawcross added it over Lauterpacht's objections. Now, the other aspect of the story that you need to complete this evening is that one of the 22 men in the dog was Hans Frank. And he is the fourth man in my story. Why is he the fourth man in my story? He's the fourth man in my story because he, in a curious way, connects the three families, Buchholz, Lauterpacht, and Lemkin. Hans Frank arrives in Lemberg on the 31st of July, 1942, to celebrate the anniversary of the incorporation of District Galicia into the general government following Operation Barbarossa when the Germans broke the pact uh, with the Soviets. He arrives and on the 1st of August 1942 he gives a big speech in which he in effect announces the uh, elimination of the entire Jewish population of Lemberg. And that population and that of the surrounding regions includes the entirety of the families Buchholz, Flaschner, Lauterpacht and Lemkin. What the three families have in common is there is only one survivor from each family. In relation to my grandfather, of a family of about 80 individuals in 1939, by 1945 he was the only one uh, alive. And so there is this connection uh, with the, uh, if you like, implementation uh, of the final solution. Lauterpacht and Lemkin prosecute Hans Frank, but they do not know when the trial opens that Hans Frank has been directly involved through that visit and through other actions in the deaths of their entire families. They only learn that, each of them, right at the end of the trial. And in the research, as you'll find in the book, I come across documents in which both men home in on Hans Frank in the dog. Of course, the... Uh I mean, parenthetically, isn't it... I, I, I should just say, because this is a really interesting document. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, there it is. I found this document in, 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 in the archive of Columbia University. It's from the personal papers of um, Raphael Lemkin, of which very little remains. This is one of those famous yellow legal sheets. You can't quite see it as yellow. And on it, Lemkin has written the word uh, genocide 25 times and then cross them out. I date it to around, it's 1944-1945. I read this piece of paper, and we're all, those of us who are lawyers here know that you look at documents, you look at documents, you look at documents, and that which stares you in the eye, you do not see until you, you come to the 55th reading or something. And I noticed on that reading, right in the middle of the page, and here you see it highlighted in red, the word Frank. And it's the confirmation of the connection. I then found more writings by Lemkin about Frank, and I found similar material in relation to Raphael, uh, to, to Hirsch Lauterpacht. They were both very focused on Hans Frank after they discovered they were prosecuting the man who they saw in the dock as most responsible 
for the deaths of their families. Well, I think that's probably a good moment to uh, bring on our next guest. Uh, you want to come up, uh, uh, Nicholas Frank, who uh, is actually the uh, son of Hans Frank and a character, a figure, uh, you two are by now old friends, but uh, yeah, a figure in your book. I'm going to greet you, <laughs> my friend. And, uh, this my father could have seen me in this museum for genocide and embracing him. Have a seat, Nick. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's an obvious question. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your childhood and uh, what you remember about your father, Hans Frank. I had a wonderful childhood. I was. The youngest kid of five, four siblings I had. And they're all dead now. I'm the last one. And I knew very soon that I'm the member of a very powerful family living in a, on the Wawel in Krakow. And we had another weekend castle, Kressendorf. I had a lot of toys. And so far I was very happy, but there was one scene which I would say nowadays, 77 years old, it saved my life. I was running in the castle Belvedere in Warsaw around a big round table and my father always was on the other side and I was crying because I longed to get into his arms and he was saying to me, you are not belonging to our family. What are you doing? What, want, what do you want? Uh, you are a stranger. In German, it's Fremdi. And uh, this built up a distance between my father and me because he saw that I'm not his son, but the son of his best friend, the uh, governor Lush, who was later shot by Himmler people. And this, I would say, saved my life. Although it was not true, as you found out later on. Well, it wasn't true. No. Well, um, you've written a book of your own. Uh, I guess it's about almost 30 years ago that you published this book. Um, tell us a little bit about what you learned and what you revealed in that book and why you thought that was an important thing to do, what your message was, and, and what the reaction to that book was. It started that I um, became more and more furious about the silence in Germany. Um, nobody was talking inside the families. The German historians really did a brilliant job. I think that's not a single crime left out which uh, Germans have committed during those 12 years, which is not thoroughly has been researched and written down. But inside the family, uh, the German families uh, never acknowledged uh, the crimes we had committed. And it made me more and more furious. And I wanted to show, I saw that I, I'm writing a political book. <laughs> um, but it was full of foul language because I addressed from the very first line till to the last line my father per you, in German du, and confronted him with all the documents which I found in about 20, 30 years of research. And the book was published when I was nearly 50 years old because first subconscious, then in full conscious, I never wanted that this father is going to ruin my personal life. And so I did it. The reaction was, unbelievable, I would say. Um, when the book came out, uh, the weekly illustrated newspaper, Stern Magazine, has bought it and was printing in, in front one-fifth of the book. And we had really thousands of letters who always were hoping that I should be hanged as well as my father. But uh, 
Uh, on the other side, I would say I, I got them, the German people, and till now it is, is on the small level, it's still selling to the next generation. There are some people in Germany who are interested in what their parents and grandparents were involved in. And I bought it. And that's well, how I but, met But you. only for 10 cents, something like this. Yeah. <laughs> Too cheap. <laughs> Well, uh, speaking of documentation, I think we have um, a, a special bit of documentation that you are going to contribute to the museum. And do we have a clip of that? So uh, Nicholas Frank is in possession of family footage uh, from the Jewish quarter in Krakow during the war. Color footage, it's quite remarkable. And this has not been widely seen, has it, Nicholas? Or has it? I, um, How widely viewed has this footage been up until now? How many people have seen this? Not many. And uh, for his movie, he cut out this uh, young girl in the red. Right. The, 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 of course, Philippe uh, has made a film with Nicholas and another uh, son of uh, a leading Nazi of that time, and they did adapt some of this uh, footage for that film. But you're going to give the entire. Uh, footage as a donation to this museum. Have I got that right? Yes. Uh, it, it's extraordinary uh, and that even at this late stage of history with respect to the Holocaust, new materials or little known materials are still coming to light. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about why you feel it's important to make this donation, in particular, why to this institution when there are so many others, obviously, that if you had chosen, you could have, you could have easily given. I, I got this movie about, I would say, five, year, five years ago. The American Jewish lieutenant who arrested my father on the 4th of May, 1945, um, who took him in an open jeep together with another American soldier to the lake of Tegernsee. He became friend with my mother. And my mother handed him over the private diary which my father has written during the time when he was 18 to 22 years old. And also this clips of a movie uh, it's everything not in the order, it's just somebody had done it. And one of the, I think, the great niece of Lieutenant Steinberg, he, she uh, wrote me a mail and she handed over to me this film about four years ago. And I also, another aunt of hers, which also the lieutenant took with him is the leather coat of my father. And this coat I bought for $500, and it's now a scapegrow in my garden at the little lake we have built. And I enjoy it every day when I look at this coat, and that sets your last stand. So, so Nicholas, in effect, this film had been taken as, in effect, a kind of a souvenir of war by an American officer and, and just kept in his house all this time? No, he hasn't stolen it. No, no, I understand. It was a it was gift from, uh, from my mother, I would say. And on the diary, this Lieutenant Stein, he is stamped on every page, copyright Lieutenant Stein. <laughs> <laughs> but it had basically been staying in his house in the States all this time? Uh, yes, I would say that. Yeah, well, that's an extraordinary uh, and vivid picture. Can you tell us, Philippe, I mean, how much do we know about the scene that's uh, depicted here in this film? Do we have much more than just the image itself? You obviously reacted to that girl in red. I did, and I had an extraordinary experience last Monday morning, well, Monday a week, exactly, well, a week ago. Um, I do many of the interviews. We have a literary festival in the UK uh, called the Hay Festival of Arts and Literature. Some people in the room have been to it. And last, actually it was exactly a week ago, it was last Tuesday, I interviewed Thomas Keneally, uh, the author of Schindler's List. And when we met in the green room beforehand, I said that I had an idea. Um, 
I, we, uh, we were talking about Schindler's List, which, uh, or Schindler's Ark, uh, as he called it when he wrote it. It was changed in America to Schindler's List. Uh, and I asked him whether, uh, as you know in that book, there is a girl in a red dress. And I asked him whether in front of an audience of about a thousand people, I could play a clip, which is just the one we've played now. Um, and I didn't want to tell him what was in it, but I said to him, if you want to look at it before we go on stage, just tell me and you can see it. And he said, no, I want to be surprised like everyone else. So we sat in an auditorium like this and the clip went on and he turned to watch it on a giant screen and it stopped on the girl on a red dress and the audience could not see his face at that point, but he, a tear, I could see his eyes really welling up and he was sort of speechless for a moment. Um, no doubt there were many people in the ghetto, many young girls who wore red dresses, but when I saw this for the first time, it struck me as astonishing that in this few seconds of footage, because this is basically all there is uh, from the ghetto, there's a little bit more, but it's just a few seconds of footage, one of the characters should be a girl in a red dress. We did establish that neither he, as he told me, was aware of the footage, obviously, and certainly Steven Spielberg, who then made the film, was unaware of this footage. But there is here a point of connection the, between fact uh, and fiction. I don't know who that girl, who this girl in a red dress is. I would love to know uh, who this girl uh, in a red dress is. Uh, uh, there are many characters in, in, in my book who I've chased uh, all the way to the end and found out who they are. Uh, she, she is not one of them. Well, uh, we only have a few more minutes for this part of the uh, evening before we go to your questions, and I wanted to use that uh, brief time to ask each of you uh, for kind of a last reflection. I mean, in different ways, each of you has been uh, occupied with the research of, these, of this history of the Holocaust for many years. And I would just, I think, I, I think everyone here would be interested to hear your reflection, we'll start with you, Nick, about why, why you found it so important um, to spend, as you said, what was it, 20 or 30 years gathering those documents, remembering, insisting. Tell us a little bit about what we all need to um, do to keep that memory alive and to learn from that history. I only can speak for the Germans, so I will hate it. And uh, for Germany, um, we committed the most horrible crimes in history of human being, I would say. And till nowadays, till today, till to this evening, we never really acknowledged what we have done. And uh, because we are lacking of empathy, whenever I'm talking inside Germany, I'm asking the listeners, have you ever put yourself in the soul of a Jewish mother together with her two kids, for instance, having to jump into a cattle car, being transported through days and nights to the east without drinking or eating. And then they came to the Rampe, and suddenly they took away the two children. Have you ever thought of yourself being in this situation? And they, they can't do it. They don't do it, and I think that's, a, for me, it's the first way to get a millionth of a touch what we have done to innocent people. And uh, only for, for the Germans, I don't think we, we have built a lot of monuments. I always uh, wanted to have a monument of a crocodile's tear 
the perpetrators are building monuments for their victims. There is something wrong about it. And I don't trust my fellow Germans. I think because we have never really acknowledged we are personal, the second and third generation, we are not responsible personally. But by chance, we are Germans. And I found out in all my researches concerning my father, my father was the biggest coward I ever came across. And this cowardice is not only his, but this is something which belongs to the German character. And my fight all my life long, oh, I was such a coward myself. But in the background, I always was my father. And I wanted not to be like my father. And he, the cowardice of my father, led him to the gallows. And this always was for me a fight not to become really his son, so the same coward character as he was. Philippe? Well, I think the connection between the two of us, which I've come to understand as Nicholas and I have come to know each other over the last four years and become friends, which itself is a pretty remarkable thing, given his father's role in my grandfather's life, is that we grew up in an environment of silence. Um, I went to Lemberg, I went to Lviv, because I wanted to know what happened. Um, my mother gave me a few documents, which in effect opened a door and led into a space with more doors, and I followed those doors. Now, why did I do that? Why did it happen when I was 50 years old that all of a sudden I go off uh, on this journey? I, it's hard to explain in a sense, but there was something internal that made me want to know um, what had happened. If you just give me a copy of the book, there's a, I open the book with a quote um, from a very well-known French psychoanalyst who wrote in 1975, what haunts are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And I suppose in a way, we were both haunted by the silences uh, of others. I I've found, as you will see in the book, um, the answers to the questions that I posed myself. Why did my grandfather leave? Why did he leave his daughter uh, on his own? What happened to my mother? Why did my grandmother stay in Vienna? I found answers to all of those questions, and I feel um, I have a lighter step because I have answers to those questions. But even more importantly than that, what I learned was that out of the darkness, and I take the term, I take those words from the review in the New York Times that was published about a week ago, a very generous review uh, of my book, is that out of this terrible darkness, uh, something nevertheless grew which was a good thing. I am a perennial optimist. I'm more optimistic than Nicholas. We debate this very often. How could it be that he has ended up in the place that he has ended up, and I've ended up in the place that I have ended up? And I suppose what it is is the story that I've uncovered of two remarkable men, Lauterpacht and Lemkin. One truly terrible man, Hans Frank, and then my grandfather, is that even out of this conflation of most horrific events, something occurred which has the capacity to do good. And that is an empowering thing, and that was a surprise. And I think that positive note also has to go forward in terms of my relationship with Nicholas. When our film, My Nazi Legacy, came out, it, it played in cinemas in the UK and in the United States and at festivals and things. But when it came out in the UK, Nicholas and I were invited to be on the main morning radio program called the Today Program, which many of you will know. 
and we were interviewed by um, Britain's most famous radio broadcaster. And at the end of the interview, he asked me how I felt sitting with Nicholas Frank. And I said to him, John, this was a couple of days after the killings at the Bataclan in Paris. I said to him, imagine in 70 years' time a scenario in which a grandchild of one of the victims of the Bataclan sits with the son of one of the killers of the Bataclan and says to you, we have become friends. That it is possible in the space of 70 years to find a way of reconciliation and understanding about terrible things that happened that at least opens up the possibility that man's capacity to do terrible things to himself and herself is accompanied by a capacity also to create the possibility of a more hopeful and positive world. And that seems to me the positive message, which is what I want to focus on in relation to these dark and very complex issues that we are dealing with. Well, on that uh, very hopeful and um, profound note, um, I think it's time for your questions and your participation. We have, we have something from Twitter. It should be coming up in front of me any second now. <laughs> or so the techies tell me. All right, maybe I'll tell, uh, let's, uh, quick ground rules here. You're, we're, we're looking for questions. We know that you also have uh, comments. If you do have a comment, please try to keep it brief and lead it into a question. Uh, if <laughs> things get a little long in any case, I may have to call time on you. So those of you who want to join, you have microphones in the two aisles on the right and the left, and when you get there, I'll call on you and we'll take it from there. Do I have Twitter yet? I guess not. Okay, so we won't tweet. We'll just speak like normal human beings <laughs> in more than 140 characters each. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, you're first. Yeah, that, that's just as well because I'm not real good at tweeting. Um, <laughs> good evening. Uh, I did have a question for Herr Frank. Uh, it's something I've often wondered about. I don't know if you'll have the answer. I will keep it brief. Um, while your father was away, uh, undergoing trial at Nuremberg, he wrote a memoir in which he uh, discussed a story that Hitler was being blackmailed by one of his nephews be, who claimed that Adolf's uh, grandfather had in fact been Jewish. Now historians have studied this thoroughly and concluded it is absolutely not true. There is no evidence that Hitler had any Jewish ancestry. But it, the story was written by your father. And I'm wondering if over the years you're aware of this and whether you have any idea why he would have written such a story. Um, my father, before Hitler took over power in 1933, um, there was this in some newspapers, in Bavarian newspapers, uh, comes this rumor mm -hmm. out of nothing and uh, Hitler asked my father, he was, uh, before they took over power, my father was a personal lawyer of Hitler in Munich. So he asked uh, my father, please find out if there is any truth in it. And my father did, but he couldn't find anything. And if he would have found something, at least in his uh, manuscript, which he wrote in the, inside the prison in Nuremberg, he would have uh, written it down, that maybe he was silent all the way along with the Third Reich, but now it was over, he would have written it down. And also there are a lot of historians who tried uh, to get this relationship to a Jewish family why a Jewish servant who was also in the house of his uh, grandfather and so, but they never found out that everything. But true is that Hitler was very nervous about it and asked my father to, to give some proof. And for sure he had also said to him, if there is any proof, please don't tell anybody. That was true. Thank you. This gentleman here. 
This question is for Felipe Sanz. It's shocking enough that genocide wasn't a concept 75 years ago, but even at the Nuremberg trials where the Nazis were being put on trial, that even the prosecution was debating the use of the term or the concept. And through your research, what did you glean about the debate and, and what the opposition to the idea of genocide was at the time? Sure. That is, that is pretty well established. I mean, the British were worried about the concept of genocide because of their colonial legacy. The trial coincided with a basically a program of decolonization. India was about to go, other parts of the former colonies were, were, were going to go over the next 20 years. And there was a fear that the concept of genocide would be used by, if you like, victims of colonialism. In the United States, there was a parallel concern. I, I don't think that Robert Jackson himself was personally opposed to the concept, but he came under tremendous pressure from Southern senators to avoid the use of the word because it, of its possible use as a legal term by African Americans in relation to civil, what we can now know as civil, civil rights issues. In fact, J Jackson was a little bit mischievous. His closing argument does not use the word genocide, makes no reference to it. But the day after he completed his closing arguments, he put out a press release in his name, which I found in Lemkin's papers, in which he referred newspapers to the arguments about genocide made by the British, the French, and the Soviets. And I suspect this was a subtle way of allowing the American media to be informed about the concept of genocide whilst not exposing him to challenge in the political context in the United States. But as you know, the United States, uh, I mean, the, conven the, the judgment did not mention the word genocide once. Lemkin describes the judgment as the blackest day of his life, worse even than the day he discovered that his entire family was murdered. He then worked towards the adoption of a genocide convention. It was ba basically his baby. That happened in 1948. The United States did not ratify the Genocide Convention for 40 years, and some of you will remember it took an accidental visit by President Reagan to the Bitburg Cemetery in Germany, where he happened to pay homage to a number of fallen Germans who were, oops, members of the SS. That was what caused the United States to ratify the Genocide Convention. Next question over here. Thank you. Um, a question to Mr. Frank. I just following up something you mentioned. I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about how a country struggles with issues of sort of collective guilt. I, my impression was that the western part of Germany did a bit better than the eastern part of Germany under the communists. And I've also been watching other countries like Poland, which I've been involved with for 25, 26 years, struggle with, you know, what with the complexity of that history. So I just wondered if you might say a few more words about that and how you think it gets resolved or doesn't get resolved. Sorry for my bad English. I couldn't get quite. I think the, the, the gist of the question was whether you could talk a little bit more about the process of reckoning with the past in Germany and compare that process in the West and the former East and whether it's true that her, she has the impression that it was a more thorough process in the West than in the East. Have I got your question yes, fairly? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Thank sorry you. if I was unclear. No, sorry. Um, first thing, when it comes to the crime during those 12 years, I'm nothing else than a chauvinist. I'm only interested in the German crimes and how we deal with it, because we have seen that uh, uh, s uh, lack of civil courage is leading to the gas chambers. So concerning the East, I'm very much upset because I have a lot of friends in Poland in the meantime. They also were the first ones who immediately translated my book against my father and later on my book against my mother. Uh, I have a lot of friends and they are completely different from the German people. 
they have now a really nationalistic right-wing new government. And they are going to the streets. There is a big opposition growing day by day. And uh, I was asked for an interview in the biggest Polish newspapers. Don't ask me what the title is. I couldn't repeat it. Uh, and immediately the Kaczynski people, you know, Kaczynski is a leading person, were completely, what, what has this guy Frank, who was the son, or is the son of a criminal who ruined our home country, what has he to tell about us or to us? So I think, and I said it also in the interview, um, they have very good chances to get out of it. Maybe the, the, the next period, when, till to the next election. But then I would say it's, it's over. And I can compare it in a very strange way with my father. They are not criminals. Kaczynski is not a criminal. My father was a criminal. But my father was always very much upset about the lazy Polish people who never wanted to obey. Yes. That is a special thing in this Poly Polish people what I really like. And when I worked for Stern magazine, I was, when the socialistic system was ruling in Poland, I liked to work there because there was not a single Polish man or girl or woman or something who not supported me by heart in my work for Stern magazine, which was then a left-winged, but a really democratic uh, weekly magazine. And I always felt a little bit pity about the communists in Poland. They had really not a good time there. Because the people are something like, in German, I, like out of, uh, I don't know the word, anarchisten. They have something very... Anarchical. Uh, yeah, anarchistic people. And therefore, there I would say I'm looking forward like uh, him, they are very optimistic about Poland, but I'm very pessimistic about the Germans. We had till nowadays a good weather democracy. We have a really good functioning democracy, but give us five years of heavy economical problems and we will really search our people who is responsible and we will find them and we are started killing again. Just to tell you about the big, he is admiring my dear friend Philip admiring Mrs. Merkel, our chancellor, who opened up the boundaries for one, over one million refugees. In the meantime, nobody is coming because they're shut down by Austria, Italy, and Greece, the borders. And um, nowadays, they burn down the Germans who knew exactly what poor people need. They burn down their homes, in the meantime, they have beaten up, by the way, five Jewish rabbis in open street. We are really on the way which we should have known better because of our past. That that is a behavior we should have left out forever, and we didn't. We have a question here. Quick uh, follow-up to the previous question. Um, you seem to be very critical about uh, the Germans today. Very quick commentary, it won't be very, very short. I happen to be a son of uh, Holocaust survivors, and I had the opportunity to visit Germany, actually went back to the displaced refugee camp that I was born in after the war. And my, my observation at that time was that the young generation has been very engaging, very willing to talk to you, actually embrace you about some of those things. I didn't even take the initiative. They're the one who did it. And then the older generation, there was absolutely no even eye contact. When I came down to the center of the town, small town called Wetzlar, kind of big picturesque type of, uh, town, about 100 kilometers north of Frankfurt. So I guess my question to you basically, being that critical basically, what would you like to see as far as the German population is concerned today, that would really satisfy, satisfy your um, position relative to Germans. Thank you. So the I'm the only one here on the stage. 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, we should recognize our crimes like the result of a football game. Life is strong. Life is stronger even as genocide. Every German should really have a wonderful life, full of tragic, full of love, full of money. But they should have built up this really a civil courage. And uh, you have to imagine we are 80 million Germans, yes? You met only one of the 10 millions who are walking uh, on a dark ball. The dark ball is the silent majority of the Germans. Mm -hmm. They hate other people. They want it to be for alone. They don't want to interfere with somebody else. And they are very silent. Now they open up because of the problem with the refugees. Now we have a very right-wing uh, party growing till nowadays. It's about 15 to 20 percent. In some parts of, the, of uh, Germany, it's already till 30 to 40 percent. Yes. And this is my fear. You always talk also me. We have, I would say like Karl Marx, different classes. You are talking to the people you know from your beginning or through school or university or whatever, but you never had any connection to this dark ball, which means it's the silent majority of the Germans. Uh, and uh, I would yeah. like to, to have it that they open up, that they open up, and that they acknowledge what we have done and not being ashamed. They should be like me nearly every day. You become so furious if you see this man who was well-educated, who played wonderful piano, who knew Shakespeare by heart. And he was addressing what he mentioned before in Lemberg in saying, I just drove through this old Jewish nest. By the way, I have nobody seen of those plat-footed Indians. Have you ever done something evil with them? And the maybe 200 German listeners, the protocol reads great hilarity. So this we have to have in mind, not to be ashamed, but to become furious and say, how could it happen? Such well-educated people are doing this crime. I never found a solution, by the way. But we should be careful that it's not uh, being repeated. And that's my personal fear. I just, I just, I don't want to. I want to come in here because my narrative and my view is very different from yours, Nicholas. We've talked about this before. Of course, I'm in a somewhat difficult position in relation to Germany because I don't live there. You have your perception, but I also have my perception of Germany. You'll remember that we, when we did the film, we attended a public screening at the Vienna Film Festival. You, Horst von Wächter, and I, and we had a tremendous debate. And at one point, I was asked in the audience, how did I feel being in Vienna at the film festival talking about our film? And a moment passed and I thought to myself, huh, what shall I do? Shall I give the diplomatic response or shall I say what I really think? And I said, no, I'll say what I really think. And what I really thought and what I said was, I'm very uncomfortable in Vienna. Vienna is a place that I walk around and I do not feel that is a country that has even begun to come to terms with its role in what happened between 1938 and 1945 in that country. And by contrast, I said to the audience, in Germany, my feeling, and it's just my feeling, that's all I can describe, is totally different. I'm very comfortable in Germany. And I'm comfortable in Germany in a situation in which I grew up in a household in which we were not allowed to have anything German. No German instruments, no German television, no German kitchenware, no German car, no German clothes, nothing German in our household. And fast forward 40 years, and I have a very high level of comfort in Germany, which I do not have in Austria. And then we go together to a place like the Ukraine. I described how in Lemberg, in Lviv, 
No one had heard of Lauterpacht or Lemkin. Why haven't they heard of Lauterpacht or Lemkin? They haven't heard of Lauterpacht or Lemkin because they're Poles and they're Jews. And they are not going to be celebrated in that place. Nick, you and I stood in a field together in the Ukraine with a bunch of men in Waffen-SS uniforms celebrating the achievements of Otto von Wächter. That doesn't happen in Germany. I think you're very tough on the situation in Germany. And if you look historically at the level of engagement with German society as compared with that of other societies, Germany has probably gone beyond any other country in seeking to embrace its responsibility for the past. So I find myself in this very strange situation on a platform with a German in which <laughs> the German attacks his own country as not having done enough and the Jewish child of Holocaust survivors <laughs> leaps to the defense of Germany. There, there is a sort of inversion of roles here. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to invite another question because I'm, I'm worried this is going to get a little bit too conflictual. <laughs> up here, but Finally, we have a conflict. <laughs> Go ahead, we please. We embrace. <laughs> um, well, I guess this kind of touches upon and piggybacks off of what you were just saying. I'm particularly intrigued with the ideas of moral complicity versus direct perpetration, that sort of thing. And there are those who argue that trying individual perpetrators of the Holocaust or of genocide in general actually obscures the scope of the crime rather than illuminating it because it takes responsibility off of the collective and puts it on an individual. I'm just wondering if you agree or disagree with that statement. Could, uh, that's yeah. a great question. Yeah. I just want to, if I may, add a, a quick point here. The question is, is to ironically, could this search for individual um, culpability obscure the collective responsibility. This became a theme of your film with uh, Otto von Wächter, who is the uh, counterpart in a way to Horst, Nick. dear Horst. Horst, sorry, who is the son of a, of a Nazi who kept insisting that there was no proof of his father's individual culpability and that that somehow relieved him. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could. Yeah. So this is a really, I mean, they've all been excellent questions, and this is an excellent question. Um, what happened? in 1945-46 was that a relatively small number of people were indicted, prosecuted, convicted, hanged or imprisoned or whatever. Few were acquitted. Fast forward 50 years. There was no system of international criminal justice until the events in Yugoslavia and Rwanda, which essentially triggered a feeling of guilt in which President Clinton of the United States led the way to setting up two international criminal tribunals. And that then led in turn to the establishment of the International Criminal Court. And there is here surely a problem. Put a few people in the dock, submit them to a televised public trial, and the signal that you are intending to send out is that the problem has been dealt with. Uh, and we know that the problem has not been dealt with. And putting a few people in the dock and charging them does not sort out these issues. It tells a story, it tells a narrative, it allows things to come out, but the upshot is a great number of people who were alleged criminals get out and about. And the experience of making the film with Nicholas, in a certain sense for I, who is a believer in the international rule of law, was a difficult experience, because I was presented, as Charles has said quite rightly, with an individual who says to me, but Philippe, my father was indicted, never caught, never tried, and on your thesis as a lawyer, he's innocent. And it's very difficult for me to counter that because he is, in formal, strict legal terms, innocent. Uh, although the evidence in terms of Otto von Wächter's wrongdoing is absolutely overwhelming, and he was indicted for mass murder. So what I learned from my own work in these kinds of cases and from the experience of working with Nick and Horst is that a system of international criminal justice is never going to be a panacea. It has to work hand in hand with domestic courts. Domestic courts, you know, don't want to charge and try their own. You know, well, in my country, there was participation in Iraq, there was rendition. In this country, there was an embrace of waterboarding, which I happen to think is a form of torture. 
And what has happened? Nothing has happened. And so you've got a sense in which the delivery of justice for a small number of people becomes emblematic of a community that is somehow dealing with this issue, but in fact it's not. And people like me have to, have to address that honestly and realistically. It's a long-term project. I mean, what I tell my students is it's only been 70 years since the idea of international justice emerged as a functioning operating system. And in the scheme of human relations, 70 years is a very small period of time. This is a multi-year, hundred, hundreds of year project, the international justice system. Gentlemen here. Uh, I'd like to mention that in uh, Mr. Lane's newspaper, I'd like to mention it because you mentioned the Times, which is excellent, but one of his colleagues, Richard Cohen, wrote an article about uh, the bravery uh, or courage of politicians or the lack thereof. And one of the examples he took from John Kennedy's book, Profiles in Courage, was about Senator Robert Taft, whose dream had been to run for president uh, or become president as his father had been. But he destroyed his chances to a great extent because he espoused the position that the defendants at Nuremberg should not receive the death penalty because he said that was contrary to US norms, principles, and ex post facto law. So I'd like to get your view about that position. Uh, about the US position? No, well, or the, the, the fact Senator... that the Nuremberg laws were, uh, came about after the yeah, act. They did, they did. I mean, I don't know, Nick, how your, your father was a good lawyer. So your father would have sat in the dock and he would have read the indictment and he would have said to himself, huh, crimes against humanity, what's that? Did the words crimes against humanity exist in 1939 when I did all my acts? And then I'm indicted for genocide? What is this word? It was invented in 1945 by some Polish Jewish professor now living in the United States. So we have to accept there is a fundamental problem. It was a form of victor's justice. But the issue of victor's justice goes forward, um, or at least the issue of a justice system in which justice is delivered by the powerful against the weak or the weaker continues to operate in our system today. Go home tonight, go to your computer, Go to the website of the International Criminal Court, switch on, open the program, look at who has been indicted at the International Criminal Court, founded in 1998. You will find that every single person who has been indicted is black or African. Blacks and Africans do not have a monopoly on international crime. Let's just talk about my own country's role in certain things over the last few years. And there is a fundamental problem built into the system, and that fundamental problem can be traced all the way back to Nuremberg, because it did operate as victor's justice in part. But, on the flip side of that, it did also allow the development of norms that I think are important, that I'm comfortable with, and that is moving towards a proper functioning uh, system of international justice. But let's not applaud ourselves too much about Nuremberg, and let's not applaud ourselves too much about the modern system of international justice we have today, because it's plainly not adequate. Right here. Um, I am a child of a uh, Holocaust survivor. Um, my mother, my whole family was, my mother's family was murdered in Warsaw Ghetto. And my father was her rescuer. He was Christian because of her she survived, and I was born in 1945. And there were witnesses. Uh, what I want to talk about is whether in your book you're discussing the role of collaboration. In my view, I do a lot of research, and I also come from Poland. I, I know the Polish language. I live there. I grew up there. I understand Polish uh, psychology. Um, in my view, Genocide could not happen. Germans could not possibly 
murdered so many Jews without collaboration, a large um, segment of local population collaborating with, with Germans, they could not possibly do it. Most of the um, Jews were murdered, European Jews were murdered in Poland, all the death camps were in Poland. And my family um, was um, likely a um, um, guest to that in Treblinka. So my question is, um, uh, Poland and Baltic states, which is Ukraine and Lithuania, are rewriting the history right now. They do not want to face, come to face in terms of what happened during the Second World War II. And yet, um, a large segment of Ukrainians and Lithuanians, they were active collaborators uh, with Germans. And Germans were very happy. Uh, there were a lot of them, and now it's coming out more and more, they were really actively shooting Jews in, um, in, in the, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. I, were, I, I, I think I'm going to time But what I'm trying on to say yeah, is, can you ad address that? Because it's a, I'm very, very concerned that, that the world is forgetting about the large, my, my father's biggest enemy was another poll because there were so many of them informing. Germans would not know when the Poles who wanted to help, where they were hiding the Jews. All of them, the Poles who died to save the Jews, they died because a friend, a neighbor, some, and the professional informers informed. And, and my parents witnessed a lot of uh, Jews being killed by, by especially in the, in, the, in, 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 the, in the countryside, by the peasant, and nobody's addressing that. There's no way. Okay. Can yeah. you? Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for the question. Yeah. Philippe is, thank you. Philippe yeah. is eager I, to I, answer. Th th thank you very much for raising this question. I mean, this was a big issue in doing the research for my book because I found myself in what is now the Ukraine. And when I arrived, there was basically a wall of silence. Unlike Germany, where you will be directed to the concentration camps, you will see stones which indicate houses where people have been uh, thrown out and so on and so forth. In the Ukraine, frankly, there is virtually nothing. Let me take you to the small town of Zhulkiev, which I have mentioned, where Lauterpacht was born, where my great-grandmother was born. Right in the middle of that town is a mass grave in which three and a half thousand people, Jews, including my family and Lauterpacht's family, were killed on a single day in March 1943. We know that they were killed by uh, orders under the direction of Horst uh, Otto von Wächter by Ukrainian auxiliary soldiers. There has never been a reckoning of what has happened. But, and it's the big but, there are remarkably courageous individuals. I come back to a phrase that I learned from Nick, the notion of civil courage. The first time I went to Zhulkiev, I went to the town museum, which is a history of this 14th century town. I went around the three rooms of the little museum and pinned onto the wall of the museum just a tiny little black and white photograph that I've put in the book of one of the entrance gates of the town of Zhulkiev. And it is an image of an entrance gate draped with posters and banners saying, we Ukrainians, and I'm paraphrasing, welcome the arrival of the Hitlerites. And it was July 1941. The act of putting that photograph in a small municipal museum is an extraordinary act of civil courage. It was an individual act. I wanted to find out who the person had done it was. It took me a week or so to do that. And I came across her. Her name is Ludmila Bibula. She is a Ukrainian. She is the curator of the museum. She is a municipal employee. And she had put that photograph up. And when I asked her why she had put that photograph up, she said, because no one will talk about these things. And because when I was a little girl growing up, my grandmother had a friend who was basically the last Jewish lady living in the town. And she told us stories of what it had been like. And I decided what was important 
was that we should not forget. And then she said to me, have you heard about our mass grave? And I said, no, no idea. You know, it's not advertised anywhere. It's not in the guidebooks. It's not, you know, they don't publicize it. I would never have known about that place, Nicholas, which you and I went to, an extraordinarily intensely emotional place, but for an act of a woman who acted with courage. So what I've learned in telling these stories is that these things are immensely complex. They are not black and white. And coming back to the big theme issue, individuals and groups, I am utterly resistant to the idea of labeling people as a group, as good or bad, as collaborators and perpetrators, or supporters on the other hand. What you learn is that things are not black and white, and things are immensely complex. And before you rush to judgment, before I rush to judgment, on anything from the question of how could my grandmother have allowed herself to be separated from her one-year-old child, a question that any parent finds almost incomprehensible to imagine. How could people have done X, Y, or Z? We need to pause and reflect and ask ourselves, frankly, the question, what would we have done in those circumstances? And that is why, essentially, coming back to the question, what has this project done for me? I think it has made me a more generous person. And it's made me a more generous person in relation to Nicholas and in relation to Horst, because my family has its own burdens, but I cannot even begin to imagine what it is like to go through life with my father as being indicted or hanged for murdering millions of people. That is a huge burden to go through, and we need to think also about that side of the story, which we don't often do. Well, on that note of complexity, I'm afraid, I know there are people who still have questions, I'm afraid we have to conclude this part of our, or conclude the evening at that point. I, I want to thank our guests, Philippe and Nicholas, for their outstanding presentation here tonight, very thoughtful and providing us much food for further thought and discussion. And we have one more word over here from the podium, but I also want to thank uh, the, audience. the Holocaust Museum for letting me be a part of it. I really learned a lot from it, too.